Um, okay, well, we're going to be looking at, over the next at least two weeks, um, the idea of religious, religious abuse. Now, this is something where people have had a lot of negative impact, uh, negative encounters with church, mm -hmm. and um, it's affected their mental health, uh, sometimes their physical health, depending on things. Um, and uh, it's just gotten to be the probably the number one reason um, why my generation has gotten out of uh, of going to church. So I thought it was it was very it, it's going to be very important to look at this. Um, the first thing I'm going to show you is a series of PowerPoint slides made by um, your favorite heretics, uh, which are going to list a series of things. Um, that kind of summarize the issues that people that my generation has been having with the church and why they are leaving the church in such high numbers. Um, I'm not necessarily agreeing with everything that's going on here, but I'm not setting out to disagree with it either. I'm just trying to comment it and and kind of work through the things mm -hmm. and um, understand that we, we aren't necessarily going to have like one answer. You know what I mean? It's going to be something to make you think to to, to make us. Um, you know, just kind of process information. We aren't even going to get through all of the PowerPoint tonight. We'll finish it next week, and then we're going to look at some other aspects of religious abuse and what it means for us and how to move forward from here. So look forward to that. Um, okay. <clears throat> now, some of the things that are said could be understood in multiple ways, and so I will try and look at it from different ways because some, depending on how you understand what they're saying, it's not necessarily wrong and some things that they mention are only wrong if it's done with the wrong attitude so okay let me stop procrastinating and get going mental health abuse the first thing that's been mentioned told you need to be delivered from your addiction or mental illness instructed to pray fast read scripture when you need professional help dismiss your emotions because hey god is in control saying therapy is not of god because it means you think god's not capable to heal you Ooh, shooey, man. There's a lot of things that we could talk about with this. Um, I do have to say, though, before we get going into um, into the ideas, that there's a lot of people who haven't encountered, sorry, encountered what the Holy Spirit can do. And so they don't think that there is such a thing as, as healing and changing and, and that kind of stuff. And so they just kind of give up on it. But for those of us who actually have encountered the Holy Spirit doing something, it very much so can change stuff, and um, you know that that's something to to keep you know in our minds. I could tell you a lot of stories of you know God miraculously moving in a situation um, where there was no hope. You know I could tell you about druggies that were completely set free and just um, you know uh, overdosed and then brought to f complete full consciousness with no sign of the drug even in their system. You know things that things that don't just happen. Um, <clears throat> And there's a lot of people who, because they have lived with it for so long, they don't think it's possible to ever not live with it. You know, like, um, I have anxiety. I've had anxiety my whole life. I'll never not have, have anxiety. I'm afraid of this. I've always been afraid of this. I'll never not be afraid of this. Kind of stuff like that. <coughs> However, there are some things, there are some things where you just need to learn to make better decisions. It's not that you need to be delivered from it. You just have to learn how to make better decisions. A good example of this would be learning how to close your mouth. There are some Christians, for instance, who think that they can just keep their mouth open all the time. They don't need to be delivered from a spirit of this or a spirit of that. They need to learn how to close their mouth. I mean, it's a very simple concept that they just haven't mastered. They, you know, oh, it's everybody else's reason why I'm shooting off my mouth and saying stupid things. You know, it's, 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 if they wouldn't have done this, if they, 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 it's like, okay, all right. One of the things that I've actually been dealing with a lot of people with lately is, there's certain groups that Christians in today's society kind of see as it's okay to hate them, right? So if you've been divorced, it's okay to hate your spouse. Um, if you, you know everybody has their own, and I had a list of them. I just did I didn't meant, uh, write them down because that's not really what we're talking about tonight. So to get to the main point, mental health in churches is usually ignored <clears throat> as a lack of faith. If you have a mental health issue, well, it's just because you don't have enough faith and you know, it's not something that you need to take seriously. It's just more of you. Um, if you just read the Bible enough and pray enough, you won't ever have a mental health issue at all. And it's just that's just not really, it's just not really a thing. Um, there's a lot of reasons 
why you may have mental health issues, including past trauma, uh, including uh, it can include sin. Yes, there are some situations where, where you, when you go to God, you you will find healing. But there's a lot of people who, I mean, even might have a physical um, problem with their brain that causes certain problems, like chemical imbalances and stuff. And to just simply dismiss it as, oh, whatever. It's like, well, hold on, hold on. If you're gonna dis you're, if you're gonna dismiss mental health, then you need to say that those people who are wearing glasses are doing so because. They don't have enough faith. Or, you know what I mean, those people who uh, were born with a handicap, they didn't have enough faith in the womb, or, you know, stupid stuff like that. It's like mental health is, is still a thing that, you know, where there's, where there's problems. So some things, some things people just have to learn to live with. Um, a good example of this is, um, you know, when there's a World War vet uh, who, has a, who has a missing arm. Is that because he didn't have enough faith? Well, no, that's because he went to war and got his arm blown off. So, you know, and it's the same thing with, with, with mental health. As far as um, being told you need to pray and fast and, and read the Bible when, when what you actually need is, is mental health, health, the thing is the Bible doesn't take the place of getting help. It's an added measure of getting help. See, we make, we make there be a contrast where there isn't one. Either you have to... Read the Bible and have faith, or you have to get professional help. That's just that. That's not true. It's not an either or. You don't have to pick between the two. Should, if you are having mental health issues, should you pray and fast and read the Bible? Yes. Should you get help? Yes. It's not something where you have to pick between the two. And there's this this I guess you call it, could call it juxtaposition that Christians do, where they put an unnecessary um, contrast between two things when it's not necessary. You know, like either you're a Republican or a Democrat. Either you are saved – I mean uh, either you are a super saved, uh, spirit-filled believer or you're just a mediocre Christian. And it's just like – hold on. <laughs> hold on. <laughs> this does not have to be this extreme thing going on here. Um, so one thing that's important to ask ourselves is did God say he would heal or did you hear what you wanted to? I, I, I've talked to a lot of people who God told me that you healed me. How did he tell you? Well, there's this person over here that doesn't believe in doctors, and they gave me a word that said that I shouldn't go to the doctor. Well, no surprise there. I mean, <laughs> so what we do is we hold on to this thing of, oh, God, you have to heal me. Therefore, I won't go to the doctor. Well, how about you pray for healing, and then if God tells you to wait, well, then that's something. But otherwise, you could go to the doctor too. So as far as the first one, told you need to be delivered from your addiction or mental illness. Well, there are some things that you can be delivered from, but there's a lot of other things where it's something you're going to have to live with. Instructed to pray fast, read scripture when you need professional help. This is an unnatural division. Good spiritual health helps in other areas. If you are having, like for instance, mental health issues, physical health issues, Having good spiritual help is or health is going to help with that. You know, um, being close to God, that kind of stuff. It's going to help you get through those dark times of physical health or mental health. Um, but being spiritual health and spiritually healthy doesn't mean you have no physical or mental issues. I'm going to say that again. Being spiritually healthy doesn't mean that you don't have any physical or mental issues. I'm going to say it one more time, just so you guys really get it in your heads. Being spiritually healthy does not mean that you do not have mental or physical illnesses. It does not mean that. There's this idea that, that Christians have had, especially the last generation, it's wrong. It's just wrong. You can be spiritually healthy and have mental issues. You can be spiritually healthy and have physical issues. This is not this. But I will say this. I've seen some people who have physical issues that are because of something that they don't want to give up. I'll give you an example. They go through trauma as a child. They compensate by overeating. So then they get become kind of greedy and, and, hoard your, and hoarders with stuff and, and, and easily jealous and have all these attitude problems that develop. And then they get, they get uh, overweight where they you know are, I mean, drastically obese and in need of some serious doctor's help. When... If they would have dealt with the trauma, that would have helped with the overeating thing. And if they also would have dealt with their attitudes and their sin life, it would have helped with once again. See what I mean? So dismissing your emotions because God is in control. 
you don't know how, and I'm going to talk about this more probably next week or the week after, about how m many times the church has, has hurt people who are who are going through serious problems with their emotions and with their mental health and those kinds of things, and just completely discredited, not helped at all. Um, the Actually, the church I was in before this, um, I started missing services. I used, I was there for everything, right? But then I started missing services because I started having real bad anxiety and depression. And, you know, everybody just, nobody cared because they all, all they could care is that I wasn't being faithful, quote unquote faithful, to the ministries that I was supposed to be doing. It's like, well, when somebody's going through a traumatic thing and they start trailing off of their faithfulness in ministry, maybe, maybe there's something else going on. Maybe they're not choosing to be unfaithful <laughs> maybe they're going through something um, so emotions and feelings cannot be your main focus and the deciding factor of your choices or your faith but you do have to control your emotions okay this is something where, where where you can't just let yourself do whatever you feel and just let your emotions and your thoughts run wild you'll get yourself in trouble you got to reel yourself back in and, and, and deal with them that's that's totally totally true um, God is in control and you do need to trust him however you can't just ignore a struggle with depression or whatever because, hey, God, any more than you can ignore a bullet wound. If you got shot, would you say, hey, God is in control? You'd probably go to the doctor, yes? I mean, I don't know about you. That's what I would do. It, once again, an unnecessary um, thing of, of convicting somebody else because of your own insecurities with your faith. Um, spiritual truths don't have to be dominant over physical truths in your, in your life. Like, you don't have to decide all your physical, what to do with your physical health based on your spiritual truths, right? Like, so spiritually, I have to trust God. That's a spiritual truth. But then you don't have to take that and say, now my physical, physical facts I'm, or truths, I'm going to have to submit to that. I've been shot, but it's okay because I'm trusting in God spiritually. Well, that's good spiritually. You should continue to trust in God while you go to the doctor to get that bullet removed. So I mean, like these are these are two different arenas, and there's a lot of people who say, well, they're, it's all connected, and I I would agree to an extent. Our bodies are connected, but that doesn't mean that just because I'll give you another good example. Let's say spiritually you are dead, you are a bitter Christian, you are just a terrible person to be around spiritually. Physically, you're in the peak shape, right? I mean, you're a you're a bodybuilder. You're you're just in great shape. Um, you get exactly the right amount of carbs. You're you're sleeping great and all this. Stuff, but spiritually, you're a mess. Well, I'm working out physically. Doesn't that mean that I'm working out sp out spiritually? Well, no, no, it doesn't. Spiritual truths don't have to be dominant over physical truths. And some things have multiple potential causes. For instance, if you read the Gospels, it'll say something about like, for instance, somebody having seizures that are caused by a demon. Does that mean that all seizures are caused by demons? No, no it does not. But it does mean that that person who was having seizures, it was caused by a demon, and so God healed him and cast out the demon where he wasn't having, having seizures, and then he also was not demon-possessed anymore. So once again, feelings don't have to reign in your life. I may feel like giving up, but at the end of the day, that's a choice to give up. Suicide, for instance, the people who struggle with suicidal thoughts and those kinds of things, suicide doesn't make you do something. It makes you either feel something or not feel something at all. It fills you with gloom, with darkness, those kinds of things, and it might compel you to kill yourself, but at the end of the day, you still have the choice of whether to actually kill yourself or not. Suicide is, is something that you feel, it's something you experience, something that, that takes, takes over your, your thought processes, especially if you let it. But you still have a choice. Suicide is a cho it is a choice. Um, so I, I even though I may feel hopeless, feelings inf feelings influence decisions, but they don't make them. The how I feel will influence the decisions that I make, but it doesn't force me to make that decision. I might feel mad at somebody, but I don't have to kill them. I might feel jealous, but I don't have to steal. I might feel greedy but i don't have to hoard so you know i mean the feelings will come and go but what you do with them is completely different science is the observation of the physical world but for many people they think that that means that there is no spiritual because they can observe the physical those are two different realms just because you can grow in the spiritual doesn't mean that that, that your mental health is in any way connected
that you have to trust God through it and stuff. And it's like, yeah, you should you should trust God, but that doesn't mean that you don't need help. It doesn't mean that you don't have to like you know swim alone. Especially because a lot of the Christians who say stuff like this, they're never there for you. They don't care. They'll say snide comments to you, and then that's just you know whatever. And they won't ever check up on you or anything. So don't get don't get don't go to a therapist. Don't go to a counselor. Don't go to a psychologist. I'm not going to be there to help you. But you know, don't go to them. And it's like, well. So you can trust in God and realize that he uses people to accomplish some things, right? God uses people, but you can also trust in him. What did we just read about in Obadiah, right? He's talking about how he's going to punish Esau. And what does he say? He's going to use Israel and Judah to do it. Well, is he going to punish Israel? Or, I mean, is he going to punish Esau or not? Yes. Is he going to do it by his own hand or by Israel's hand? Israel's hand. And what is the very last thing in the verse that we looked at last week? It says about how he's talking about how the, the people who save Israel are going to go up to Mount Zion and, and, and rule Mount Edom, and God will be and God will be the it'll be God's kingdom. They're going to be doing the ruling, and yet it's going to be God's kingdom. Exact same concept here. So you can trust in God and realize that He uses people to accomplish some things. You don't have to stand in faith. For a healing, God never said that he'd give. There is nothing wrong with getting help. For instance, uh, what if Chuck stopped going to dialysis? Well, he dies. Who fought the Canaanites? Israel, not God. God you know, was there with them. He, he equipped them. He fought with them. But it was Israel who did it. Who disciplined Esau and Obadiah? I already mentioned that one. Um, so faith is not sitting on your butt. So what some, people, some, what some Christians do is they, they do what's called having faith in your faith, right? So I have to conjure enough faith in myself, right? Like I trust, I trust, I trust, and you're working yourself up into it. But faith is actually shown by the things that you do, not by how strong of a feeling you can conjure up within yourself. All of that is is having faith in your faith, which makes it all about earning your healing, it doesn't actually have anything to do with having faith. If getting therapy is not of God, then neither is eating. If getting therapy is not of God, then neither is going to church. If uh, getting therapy is not of God, then neither is serving people. They have God too. Let them go to him. Right? I mean, hey, you're hungry. You have access to God. Go to him. Oh, you need to go, you need to, go to church and, and, and be encouraged by them and, and grow? Don't worry about it. You've got God too. Go to him. Oh, people need, people need service and love and you need to get involved with serving and loving people? Don't it's okay. They can go to God. See, it's 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 the same thing. Getting therapy is that's the same thing. So, uh, it, uh, with this being said, the 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 final pff, tying it all together with mental health. Mental health is a very serious thing that the church neglects. And part of it is that pastors aren't really equipped all that well. Another thing of it is that a lot of Christianity kind of looks down on mental health and kind of pretends like it doesn't exist because it doesn't really fit in the box. Like, what do I do when I'm having doubt and, and, I, and I go to God in prayer? It just resolves it. What do I do when I'm having recurring anxiety and depression and the Bible verses aren't working? See what I mean? It, it doesn't fit in my little box. I can't fix it. I can't be in control of the situation. Christians don't like being... No, I don't like not being in control. Christians are total control freaks. Like, ah, ah, ah. <laughs> what were you going to say? Well, I was going to say, a, a lot of the times the church tends to treat Bible verses like there's some kind of magic potion that's supposed to like... Well, almost like a magic spell. Yeah. You know, like, uh, do not worry about tomorrow. <laughs> all your worries are good. Oh, there you go. I'm not worried about it. It's like, well... <sighs> And, and studying the Bible does help, but I mean, just because you can quote a verse doesn't mean that the problem just goes away. You, you know, <laughs> like, oh, uh, Chuck has dialysis, you know, so let me quote a verse to him and then he won't have any problems anymore. It's like, well, uh, <laughs> what? <laughs> That's not really how this works. The Bible is not a book of spells. I'm so glad that you said that. Um, the purity culture. Now, this is this is one that I have mixed feelings on. The church has made you feel shameful for your sexuality or coming out was a traumatic experience, obviously talking about things like homosexuality there, um, felt you need to dress a certain way to not cause a brother to stumble or need to honor God with your body. Oh boy, that's that's a big hot topic currently. Pressure to get married so you don't burn with lust. 
The last one I don't think is as big of a hot topic as the first two, but goodness sakes. Okay, so before we even look at this, some context here. <clears throat> the Bible makes it clear that homosexuality is a sin. So there's that, as far as the first one. So we're go still going to look at it. I just want to lay my cards out on the table. And then as far as the second one, there's a lot of people who think when it comes to there's this kind of whole rape culture anti anti rape culture thing that's going on right now and it talks a lot about whose fault it is when a woman gets raped the guys or the girls to traditionally christians have said it's always the woman's fault for tempting the guy which is not true and then on the other flip side, the world has traditionally said it's always the man's fault for not controlling himself, which is also not, not true. Well, it's not that it's not true. It's not the whole truth. Here's the thing. If a guy rapes a girl, whose fault is it? The guy's. You rape somebody. It doesn't matter what the woman did. You did the raping. It's always the guy's fault. Yes. But, but... I know a lot of guys who are pigs, and I'm not going to set out a really nice meal for them. Does that kind of make sense? Mm -hmm. This is actually a thing I didn't realize um, before, is that women also have a problem looking at guys. I don't understand how a woman can find a guy attractive. So I assumed, since I do not find men attractive, and I don't see how somebody could find somebody, a man attractive... That therefore, that meant that women didn't either. Therefore, I didn't have to worry about tempting tempting a sister in Christ. <coughs> I was wrong. <laughs> I was wrong. That's not really how it works. So, <sighs> okay, let, let's let's look at some stuff. Okay, first off, how we feel is not up to us. Some people are born where they're just aroused by certain things that they can't control. That's, that's just a fact of life. Um, some things are going to turn us on sexually that we just don't really have that much control of. I understand that. Okay, but the thing is, is that just because you have an urge doesn't mean you have to act on the urge. We would agree with this, for instance, with um, murder. I might feel like killing somebody. That doesn't mean that I should kill somebody. But then when it comes to sexuality, all of a sudden people lose their minds, you know. Oh, no, if you are attracted to the same sex, you should act on it. Well, okay, why? Because love is love. Okay, so you're saying that having sex with children is okay or with animals? Well, no. It's like, well, yeah, that's exactly what you just said. So, you know, this is one of those things where this slide really comes down to an issue of morality. And I think the main issue here is how we talk to people about it. For instance... Is homosexuality is a sin? Yes. Should we should we accept homosexuals into the church? Yes. yes. Should we make them feel stupid and less? No. no. I mean, this is simple simple logic. But the the tactic in the last generation of the church has been you ridicule it. Homosexuality is worse than than any other sin that you can possibly commit. So I'm going to go around stirring up gossip and uh, causing huge problems and rebelling against the pastor, and it's fine because I'm not gay. What? Again, with this with the self-righteous thing, people are born feeling like they didn't fit in their own skin. Sometimes they're born attracted to get, attracted to getting hurt, you know, with the whole S and M kind of thing. Um, Sometimes now this is actually an issue for debate. Um, a lot of times the person isn't really born like that. It's something that develops from early trauma. For instance. If there's a traumatic experience with the father, it's more likely that the son will turn uh, gay. Um, that is that is a thing. That is really a thing. Like a lot of people don't like talking about that, but most homosexuals I've talked to, in fact, all homosexuals I've ever known in my entire life, which is at least one person. No, I'm just kidding. Just joking. <laughs> just joking. Um, have had issues with their father. I don't think that's coincidence. Um, another thing is uh, people who are attracted to getting hurt, typically have some very messed up abuse history in, in, in their childhood life and development. You know, things like that. So it, it's kind of questionable as to whether somebody is born that way or somebody experiences trauma and it turns into that. I don't know. I know that we are all born into into sin, so regardless of whether we are born with, a, with an urge or not, 
Um, it doesn't really make that big of a difference. Some people are attracted uh, to the same sex. Some people are attracted to animals, to children, etc. That doesn't mean that those things are moral to do just because you feel like doing them. The church has traditionally not been supportive of people struggling with sexuality and sexual sins. I mean, for instance, take people who are quote-unquote non-binary. Um, this is something where th these people, everyone that I've dealt with, has been severely traumatized and they really could could do well in, in finding hope in Christ, and yet the church is too focused on trying to get them to have a correct understanding of their sexuality. Now, is it important to have a correct understanding of your sex? Yes. 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 But maybe pick your battles in showing them the love of Christ. See what I mean? And this is what I'm saying. Did, did God ever save um, somebody who'd been castrated? Yes. Yes. What if, when they had been castrated, they, they wondered what that made them? Does that make me less of a man? And they start questioning their sexuality. Does that mean that God couldn't save them? Well, no, I'm pretty sure that the requirement for salvation was belief in Jesus Christ, not in co having complete understanding and awareness of your sexuality. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the lesser issue was made into the primary issue, and that's just not, not great. Um, but they have also failed to discuss sex. The, the sex has been a big no word in the church, or a big mistake there. You know, we, we want we want the kids that grow up in church to have a good understanding of sex and that kind of stuff, but then we don't want to talk about it. It's like, well, how do you hope to accomplish that goal? Um, f uh, the church has failed to give them a sense of identity, what makes them, what makes them have value, that kind of stuff, um, or anything like that, opting instead, hey, let's memorize the books of the Bible. Not that it's not important to know what's in the Bible, but maybe there's more important things than just knowing a bunch of facts about the Bible. Like, for instance, how many ex-Christians and ex and people who used to go to church do I hear say something along the lines of this? Does the Bible say anything against smoking marijuana? It's like, yeah. You can't look up every single modern, a modern problem and look it up to see if it's mentioned in the Bible. It's the idea of the Bible. It's like looking up our computers for the devil or something. Yeah, right, and it's like, well, computers didn't exist, so it's not going to say anything about computers. You have to – sometimes the Bible talks about an idea – without mentioning certain things, and in that way it transcends time. And no matter what humanity goes through, the, uh, the Bible will have things to say about it. Um, anyways, the actions that we make are our own, are, are our own, sorry, and we are accountable for them. God told us that there is a standard. Thankfully, our, identi our identity as people, as Christians, comes from God, not how we feel or what we are attracted to. Thank God. Um, I will say this, though. If you struggle with homosexual homosexuality or those kinds of things, and you, or maybe you don't have your sexuality figured out, strongly discourage you from getting into a relationship. It's not going to quote-unquote fix you. I would also strongly discourage you from going to God in prayer and saying, God, uh, why did you make me like this? Uh, please change me and stuff, because he probably won't, and you'll just end up getting frustrated. So quick to just – better just grip that bandit off quick and deal with other things, maybe even choosing not – to deal with it yet and just focus on seeking after God and being okay with the fact that you're not going to have all the answers. I know that that's kind of a frustrating thing because once again we like to have all the answers and we like things to fit in our boxes. But there's things that don't make sense in life that we aren't – especially the, the older you get, I'll say this, the older you get, the more questions that are going to be unanswered and it's just sometimes frustrating and it's getting late so I'm going to have to um, stop here I guess. Um, so either you submit to God, to God's standard, or you reject it for your own. But if you reject it for your own, you have no right to impress your standards on another. And that's the thing that really confuses me about about to this generation that we live in. They say stuff like this: "I'm accountable to my standard, but you're accountable to my standard." See what I mean? It's okay for me to, for instance, um, live a homosexual lifestyle, and you can't impress your worldview on me. But then you would say, well, I'm not okay with homosexuality. And I'd say, well, you can't push your your religion on me, Hypocrisy. but I, I can push it on you. See, it, it has to go both ways. You can't say I'm accountable to my standard, but you're accountable to my standard as well. That's not realistic. There has to be a point where we realize we won't have answers and we still trust in God. 
But we shouldn't expect to live in sin and then call ourselves Christians. 1 Corinthians actually says specifically that people who are living in sexual immorality we are to stay away from. Now, he specifically says, I'm not telling you about people in the world. I'm telling you about people who call themselves Christians who are living in sexual immorality. So you're going to have find people who are not saved. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm somebody who says, "Oh, I'm a Christian and I'm gay and I, you know, I, I I'm shacking up with all these guys and and God God loves me and forgives me," or you know whatever. It's just like, um, you don't serve the same God that I serve. I mean, struggling is one thing, but just walking in sin and saying, "Ha ha," it's, it's no, no, no. Um. So as far as this felt you need to dress a certain way to not cause a brother to something, well, there's a few things. First off, I have oftentimes felt I need to dress a certain way um, because there's like a, um, a dress policy, you know what I mean? Like girls can't wear pants, guys can't wear so-and-so. <coughs> um, but with that being said, that's not what this one's talking about. It's talking about um, when a woman dresses a certain way and it's quote-unquote causing someone to stumble. Now, you can cause someone to stumble without causing them to rape you. You know, and that's just something that maybe people should realize this conversation isn't really a black and white one. Um, so, the first thing, we should definitely watch out for one another. Hold on. No. No. How many situations have you been in life where it's that simple, black and white? I mean, really. Zero. Everything's more complicated than that. So here's the thing. We should watch out for one another. As brothers and sisters in Christ, we're supposed to be watching out for each other. I think we can all agree on that. Um, I, I, like I mentioned, I only recently realized that women can be attracted to a guy. And a guy needs to watch what he does around women, too. I, 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 I only recently realized this. I thought... You don't have to watch out. I mean, come on. Guys are gross. But no. Upon further examination, women are, in fact, aroused by men. Much to my confusion and <laughs> perplexity. Goodness sakes. Um, but the Bible also says that if our eye causes us to stumble, to gouge them out. So should a woman not dress in such a way that tempts you? Well, in the church, maybe, we should watch out for each other. But keep in mind that it's, it's on you. Jesus said, hey, if your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out. So maybe it would be best not to put it all on the woman. Like, you're causing me to stumble. Yeah, and you're the one who stumbled. So maybe it's a two-person problem and not a one-person problem. A -person. Maybe that would be a healthier way of looking at this. Um, you are accountable to one another as a family in the church. But it's not your fault if someone is going to get offended about everything. There's some, going to be some people in the church where no matter what you do, it's not going to be good enough. And I'm definitely not talking about that. But as a family, we are accountable to each other in the church. Jesus did say, woe to the person through whom temptation comes. He said, temptation is going to come, but woe to the person that it comes through. So with that being said, and we can take both those statements and say, obviously Jesus was saying that there was both people's problems, men and women. Don't dress in such a way that's gonna it's gonna cause temptation to other people. If you are an attractive person, be aware that you're an attractive person too. You know what I mean? Like not that not that I'm saying that you have to be like snotty about it, but I'm saying that there are some people who they're attractive. It's obvious that they're attractive, and it's obvious that there's a lot of people who are attracted to them. You could maybe you know, for instance, not have to look like immaculate conception every single, or perfection, sorry, immaculate perfection every single day. You don't have to dress things that show off your boobies or your muscles or whatever. You don't have to do this. You you could find a way to kind of maybe tone it down a little bit so that you don't have to be the center of attention and maybe Jesus could be the center of attention. Maybe. Now, some of us are ugly and we don't really have to worry about it, but you'd be surprised. Even ugly people have some people attracted to them. For instance, I've, I've seen a lot of attractive girls have fat guys as boyfriends or husbands. <laughs> so fat isn't attractive? Hmm? I guess. Hmm? I think they get fat afterwards. <laughs> oh, right. Um, but for instance, myself, I was like, I don't really have to worry about this because I'm not that attractive. And then people started getting attracted to me, and I was like, oh. 
well, I need to realize that there's always somebody out there. There's always some weirdo out there. So remember that. No matter how ugly you think you are, there's always some freak out there that's going to think you're the best thing since sliced bread. So, yeah, definitely ooh la la. Uh, so um, we need to honor God with our body, with our mind, with our mouth, with our attitudes. And we also need to honor God with how we treat other people. There is a middle ground in this in this discussion. You don't have to dress like a nun. Just think about dressing decent. <clears throat> I wouldn't walk walk around. Uh, I wouldn't walk around with a dildo, right? I wouldn't do that. I would think that that would be inappropriate, right? So maybe as Christians we can come to a place of saying dressing like this is inappropriate. It's not that I don't have the right to or the freedom to. It's that I'm going to give up my freedom for the sake of my brothers and sisters in Christ. So maybe instead of a felt like you have to dress a certain uh, to dress a certain way, maybe you should just automatically do that and realizing that some people are going to be tempted. Boys and girls, this goes for both. And you need to honor God with your body. Yes, yes, you do need to honor God with, God with your body. You've been bought with a price. Your life is not your own. That you can't just go out and do whatever you want. To go out and do whatever you want is actually the opposite of Christianity. So, pressure to get married so you don't burn with lust. Boy, this is this is this is one that's not as brought up as the other two, but it definitely is still a thing. First off, not everyone should marry. The Bible actually talks about this. And furthermore, not everyone is capable of marriage. I actually see a lot of people whining and complaining about, you know, how they want to find this person to get married to, but they don't they just like the idea of marriage, not actually being married. Being married is where you are you have to change for somebody else. You have conflicts with someone else that you're around all the time and you can never get a break from. You know, you have to make these decisions together. You can't just go and spend your money how you want. You know, there's all these different added complexities, and I'm not saying that marriage is a mistake. I'm not saying that marriage is a mistake. I'm just saying it's not for everybody, and there's a lot of people who like the idea of it. I, I, I see a lot of uh, women who've been divorced one, two, three times, and they're still trying to get remarried again. And what they don't realize is, no, no, you're not getting it. You go with you. You didn't actually like the idea of marriage. Well, they, they treated me like this, and yeah, that's what happens in marriage. Your spouse mistreats you. You forgive. If you can't deal with not winning you're not marriage material if you can't deal with you know um having somebody around you all the time who has a differing opinion than your own don't get married you know people have this idea that marriage is happiness and sex happiness and sex well i just get lonely and i want someone to cuddle with on the couch at night so get a dog i, I want a guy who makes me laugh so watch a tv program like you don't have to get get married for those things marriage is more than just you it's more than just making yourself happy so marriage isn't really for everything everyone and some people are just not capable of marriage they're just not capable of it uh, marrying won't take away temptation it, it's not like once you get married you won't oh i don't i don't need porn anymore or oh i'm not tempted to look at other women anymore no even if you're married if you even if your wife was to put out for you every single time you were even slightly aroused you would still be aroused by other women you will not cease to be a man just because you're married that's stupid you will notice other women you will see other women now what you do with that noticing is up to you but it's a natural human process to be attracted that's why the species repopulates imagine how hard it would be to have sex if you did not find any anybody attractive like there was no such thing as arousal how difficult would that be i mean really anyways <clears throat> so you still have to con learn to control your thoughts regardless of whether you get married or not yes we are expected to control our thoughts to live moral lives that is offensive to the world but that is the way of morality having morals is something that is oftentimes offensive because it means I don't get to do what I want. I have to do what's right. There's no reason why two people madly in love with each other shouldn't pursue each other. And that's all that Paul's talking about. If there's two Christians, they just they just can't help it. They're head over heels for each other. They just they they both want to marry. Hey, it, it's better to get married than to burn with lust for each other. You, you aren't – and that's, he even talks about this. You aren't sinning in getting married. However, I would I would encourage you if you're single, stay single. If you're married, stay stay married. 
You know, stay as you were when you were saved. Don't don't try and look out there for happiness. And he, he goes to this whole long argument in the chapter. And so is it get married to, to so you don't burn with lust? No, 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 no. He, he's no, he's he's not talking about the, the way of marriage is how you get over masturbation. That's not what he's talking about at all. He's talking about two people who desire each other. And he even talks about this if you're engaged to the person. You, you read through the chapter again. I mean, see what he's actually talking about. It, it'll blow your mind away. I just read it a couple days ago, and I was like, "Wow, this has nothing to do with, I, with what I, I." I always thought he was saying, "Hey, if you're having a problem uh, being sexually aroused and you don't want to masturbate, get married." That's not what he's talking about at all. He's not talking about masturbation at all. He's not talking about getting rid of your uh, burning with lust. He's talking about when two people desire each other. If they want to get married, they're not sinning. That's that's his whole point completely different than, than what I heard growing up. So, um, <clears throat> just a minute. And no, your spouse doesn't have to have sex with you because their body is yours. Under that same argument, they could say, well, your body's mine and I don't want to have sex. See what I mean? Um, and I know the verse you're going to bring up about, you know, not, not withholding. Th no, that no, no, no. I was going to say something else. Oh, go ahead. No, no, I, I just, I've, Read, I've seen so many books, some of these my mom has read, where like the wife has to have, has to give. Where the man's way always rules. And they take that one verse where it says, you know, don't withhold your body from your husband. But they forget the other part of the ver verse where it says, don't withhold your body from your wife. And he talks about, you know, how, e how each person's body is, is, is the other's. So under that same argument, you could say, okay, well, the wife said no. I will say this, though. It's wise for a wife to, when they say no, to give the hope of something in the future. Because men are kind of um, easy to get mad when sex is denied. So this is a better way to say no. Something like this. Now, I tell you, because you, you're obviously women, right? Uh, Wait, what? <laughs> it was a joke. Oh, because sorry. I'm talking about something, and you two are, you are both men, so it doesn't yeah, really apply to you. Right, right. But if a woman says something along the lines of this... Or a wife says something like this. Not tonight. How about tomorrow? See what I mean? So that way the guy doesn't get all butt hurt because, you know, he was denied. But the woman still doesn't have to, you know, do whatever. With that being said, though, what married people try to do, women more than men, is they try and use sex as a way of gaining power in the relationship. So if the woman, you know, feels like she's been hurt or she doesn't get her way or whatever, she'll hold sex over the guy's head. You know, like, oh, well, I'm not, then I'm not going to have sex with you. It's like, well, that's not really... And that's what Paul was talking about when he says not to, you know, withhold from, from your spouse. Um, it's wise if your spouse is wanting something to, you know, make it happen. And as much as it's hard for you younger guys to, to understand, sometimes when you're married, you just don't want to have sex. It's like, I really don't want to. And your wife's like, give it to me. And you're like, I don't want to. Yeah. It's hard for you guys to imagine now, but when you've been married a couple of years, you'll, it'll happen to you too. I can imagine. <laughs> yeah, you can, you sick freak. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. Um, okay. But, however, there shouldn't be repeated denials. You know, no, we won't, no we're not going to have sex. No, we're not going to have sex. Because the thing is, is it will build a wall between you and your spouse, and it will cause, um, cause further temptations for them. Um, so with that being said, it is a better it is a better idea to have sex often with your spouse and to not let yourselves go into an area of not having sex. I tell you this because I imagine you guys will one day be married, um, and it's just a, a good practice to get into that. I know most people who have problems in their marriage they just stopped having sex. I know it sounds overly simplistic, but it happens a lot. Um, I, I know one woman, she was having all kinds of temptations, and I told her, I said, are you having sex with your husband? She said, no. I said, well, why not? Well, he this and this, and I said, so get over it and have sex. She did. The problem went away. I'm telling you, married <laughs> people who aren't having sex, they get very snooty with each other. They just get, they just, it's just, it's not good. It's all that build up. Yeah, I, seriously though, like they just get all mad at each other. South Park even has an episode about this where the wife's not not having sex with the guy Randy, I think is his name, 
And uh, so he starts this whole baking thing and, and, and everything. Yeah. And then they have sex, and he's like, yeah, forget the whole cooking thing. I don't need it anymore. And that's kind of that's kind of how it, how it works. Um, so pressure to get married so you don't burn with lust. Here's the thing. Really, you should weigh it a lot before you get married because it's definitely not for everybody. So we did not even kind of make it as far as I wanted to get, but we can't go any further. So we're going to stop on this fear-driven theology. That's what we'll pick up next week. And so we're going to be on this a lot longer than I thought we were. <laughs> Um, any questions about what we talked about tonight? Uh, I, I just want to say something about... Um, say something. This, the same-sex thing. Um, a lot of times, sometimes for people who struggle with same-sex desires, mm -hmm. some, I've, I've heard testimonies where um, different people where God will take the de desire away completely for mm -hmm. same-sex, and for others, like, he'll let them still have it, have those desires, but they can... You know, live their, their life according to, you know, yeah. what God wants. For right, and, and and there's another thing. I'm I'm really glad you brought that up. So there's two things that I want to build off what you just said. The first thing is, um, just because like if you're having like same sex desires or something like that, the probably the best course of action is just not get married and to stay single. Because if you get married with an opposite sex person that you're not attracted to, it's just going to cause you problems, and you're not going to be happy. And if you act on it, you're going to be living in sin. Just like if you're attracted to children or horses. <laughs> you, 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 it's not like you can just act on it. And I know that sounds unfair in today's society, but it, it really is the best course of action. Um, then the second thing is you said about how God sometimes will take away that. And um, I've even had uh, some things – now this is going to sound freaking weird to you guys. I, I accept that. Um, uh, there, was a, there was a person who was involved in an in occult. In and um, there was a lot of demonic things going on, and they actually were gay. And when they got out of the cult, they had a demon cast out of them. I'm not joking, okay? And they were no longer attracted to the same sex. Crazy freaking stuff. Crazy freaking stuff. I wouldn't have believed it if the person wasn't uh, – it happened to them. Maybe it, it Crazy. Be. And and I'm not saying homosexuality is, is, uh, is, is always demon that. possession, okay? <laughs> People are going to be like, get this. Demon That's exactly what I'm no. saying. Homosexuality is not demon possession. Two completely different things. No, I, I... But it was weird as freaking cuss. And it's just like uh, drugs, you know. Sometimes God will just take it all away, and then other times you have to struggle with it. Yeah. It's so weird because, you know, I feel like the world kind of mocks the idea of pray the gay away. Mm -hmm. But I think in some circumstances, maybe that's... That's true in a sense, you know. Well, now see, that that's one of the things I really was trying to emphasize is you shouldn't say, I'm like this, therefore I can just uh, pray and God will deliver me from it and he'll change me. In most <coughs> of the situations, God won't change you. Right. In most of the situations, the struggles that you struggle with are going to be your struggles. You know, like for instance um, – and the thing is just because we don't want to have a certain struggle doesn't mean it's not – we're not going to. You know, like – I I get suicidal and then I get over it and I feel fine. I think you know I don't even I don't understand why I was ever suicidal and then I get suicidal again. I think how did this happen again? You know, and, it, and it's just one of those things where well that's my struggle and I can pray as much as I want. God's not going to take away that struggle and in another couple of years eventually I'll come back again and I'll have to deal with it again. It's an emotional roller coaster. I think it just depends on the person and what God wants to do that person. It life. depends on the person. That is a very good thing like, to say. When I was in my internship program, I was really attracted to this guy mm -hmm. and he was going to our church and one of the rules was you couldn't date. And so I was just like, God, please, please take this desire away from me. And I didn't have that desire towards him anymore. I, I think it really depends on the person and the situation and what God wants to do in their life. And what was this guy's name? No, I'm just <laughs> kidding. I'm joking. Just joking. I'm, I'm joking. But that actually is a really good example. Um, another one is, you know, my dad, you know, he, he got saved and pfft, that's the end of the whole drug addiction thing. I know other people who got saved and they wrestled with it for years. I know one guy who was, um, I believe he was a Christian. I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe he wasn't. I was just mistaken, but I think he was a man who was a Christian and um, he was uh, was an alcoholic, and he actually died of an overdose. Yeah, I think that makes it the the people that God that takes it away. 
I think it makes it harder on the people that God doesn't take away. Yeah, because, because they think that he always they does. They think he always does, and it can happen to anybody. I tell, you, I tell you something that I found personally frustrating. <clears throat> there has been some people who have had depression, anxiety, and those kinds of things because they were living in a certain sin. So then they got out of the sin, they repented, they, they got back in a good relationship with God, God took it away, and so they, excuse me, they therefore assume that everybody else who has that, they're living in sin. And it's like... That's not how it works. You know, you can have multiple causes for a symptom. Did you know that? It's the same thing with, with doctors, you know, like they'll, they'll, oh, what are your symptoms? This, well, you could have this, 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 let's do some testing. Yeah. But Christians don't do that. They're like, hmm... Definitely this. And it's like, what? Uh, <laughs> okay. Oh, whatever. Anyways. Yeah. Okay, so good comments. Anything else? Uh, also, um, Go ahead. when it talks in the, the verse, it talks about um, how you're supposed to stay away from professing Christians who's, who are living in mm -hmm. uh, yep. sexual sin. First Corinthians like, chapter yeah. 5. Does that, how does that apply to people who, who struggle with, like, and stuff. That's not what he was talking about at all. Because, I mean, technically, if you're struggling with the sin, you're still walking in it. No. Though... No, those are that's completely wrong. Really? Yeah, that's completely wrong. You can be more wrong. Struggling with sin is where you are trusting in God and you're trying to stumble your way to seeking him. Living in a sin is where you're saying, it's okay that I'm doing this. I'm not going to even stop. I'm doing this. And you're openly I'm... living in it. Everybody knows and you don't care who knows and you're talking about it all the time about doing it and you're happy about doing it. So to walk, to walk in it, you have to not care about, about It's not just about not, not caring. You're not trusting God through it. There's no attempt at, at combating it. It's more of just an acceptance of it. Um, it. There's also a hardness of your heart that comes along with it where it's like you turn bitter towards other people and you stop loving people. And, and you might think, how does this have anything to do with that? You'd be effing surprised. There's these people – a great example. Great example. Some people um, that were actually uh, – well, I can't get into details at this point, but um, they were going around stirring up problems uh, with pastors in the area, trying to take over churches and trying to trying to cause church splits. That would be living in sin. Then there's some people who accidentally cause a church split. Um, I'll tell you, maybe they. Um, um, here, here's a good example. A new pastor comes to a church. He doesn't know much of the church's history, but he's trying to help them to grow grow closer to God. He's trying to teach things that will help them, and some of the p members of the church get upset at the things that he's teaching. Not that they're wrong. They just don't like it, so they leave the church. See the two differences? One, somebody is, is trying to destroy the church. The other, per the other person, somebody is trying to help the church, and some people just don't want to be helped. So, like, for instance, one Christian is, go is gossiping, and they just have a bad attitude, and I'm not going to change. They're the one who's wrong. Versus, I said something stupid again. See the difference? Yeah. One, I, I am, I'm like, I'm just going to talk bad about you. And you know what? Suck it up, buttercup, snowflake. And then the other person is like, you know... The, you're gonna it, you're gonna offend some people, you know what I mean? And, and you're, it's not that you're trying; it's just that some people are just gonna be offended. Does that kind of make sense? <coughs> and so when it said, when Paul's talking, if you read read First Corinthians this week, and you'll see what he's talking about is people who call themselves Christians, but they're living boldly in the in the sins, and they don't even think that they should change. And the context of him saying that is there's a guy who's having sex with his father's wife, and he, and he says this, you're tolerating this, and you're so happy. Look at us. We have somebody who's in the church who's, who's doing this gross sin. He says, not even the world accepts this, and you're accepting it. You should be ashamed of yourselves. And then he says, as I wrote to you before, I, I, I'm explaining this now. I wasn't saying to, hang around, to stop hanging around with people in the world. I'm saying people in the church who are doing this. The context of him saying that is in this guy sleeping with his father's wife and being proud of it. That's the context. So, you know, when you take one verse out, it seems like, oh, if I'm struggling with anything, I people shouldn't hang around with me. Well, that's stupid because everybody struggles with something. Yeah. See what I mean? Yeah. Paul struggled with stuff. So you, what are you saying that, that they shouldn't have hung out with Paul, who is an apostle, who is teaching them the ways of Christ? I mean, come on. No, Isaiah, no. No, everybody's going to struggle with a sin. That's totally not, what's, not, what, not what he's saying at all. Yeah. At all. Cool. Don't 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 guilt trip yourself about that at all. You no, just just no no. All right, thanks for clarifying. 
Yeah, I, that's that's something that, that a lot of people tried to teach their poor theology to me, and then I started researching myself, and I was like, nope, that's not, that's right. not right. I know what the Bible says, and so I get a little heated still about this because I still remember, you know, these these super Christians who are so Christian that everybody else can't measure up to them, and then ah, goodness <clears> sakes, yeah. goodness sakes. I grew up in churches like that. Yeah, so. I was reading this book. Sort of like by um, Dobson, um, Dr. Dobson from Focus on the Family. Um, anyways, I can't remember what his first name is. Not important. And he was talking about the way that when he was a little boy, his father and him were driving in a car, and he said, Now, son, when you get a little bit older, you're you're going to you're gonna feel things, and, and that's normal. And, uh, you know, you're going to maybe even want to, you know, kind of explore your body and don't, don't feel guilty about that. That's a natural process. And so his father in that one moment made it where his son wouldn't go the rest of his life feeling guilty about masturbation. In that one simple action, whereas in the churches that I grew up, everything was just connected. Homosexual. I mean, uh, uh, masturbation is, is evil. And it's like, okay, where do you get that from? Well, because Jesus said not to – not to if you look at a woman with lust in your eyes, you're committing adultery. It's like, okay, so how does lusting equate with masturbation? Well, because you can't masturbate without lusting. Maybe for some people, but I think – I'm going to disagree with you on that. Men find it very easy to masturbate without even thinking about anything. <laughs> oh, goodness sakes. Anyways, it's one of those things where, where people – People will try and make you feel guilty, and the thing is this: you, God doesn't want you living in living in, in guilt and in shame and in regret. Okay, you're gonna struggle with stuff. That's just a fact of it. You're gonna have good days. You're gonna have bad days. You're gonna have days when you when you mess up and days when you don't. When you when you don't mess up, you shouldn't go to God and say, "Look how good I'm doing." And when you do mess up, you shouldn't say, "I promise I'll never do it again." I say that a lot when I pray, like I. But then you always do it again, right? Yeah, it's just like and so that's kind of my point. God doesn't doesn't hold you to hold you to that. It's like this. Lord, you're so good. I'm going to continue to trust in you even though I keep messing up because my salvation's on you, not on me. It's not that you're going out and saying, "Yeah, I'm going to keep looking at porn, guys." It's not that big of a sin. Jesus is just going to forgive me anyways. N no. No, no, no. That's not what I'm saying at all. May it, in fact, yeah, Rome, in Paul in Romans Paul talks about that should we go on sinning? May it never be. <laughs> and uh and no, it's it's not that we should go on sinning, it's that we are going to mess up. So. Anyways, okay, anything else? I blame um